I spent 20 years of my life hacking online video games. Back when I started up, it was the Wild West. Today, the online game is basically a totalitarian government, right? When you're inside the game, you have to play by the game company's rules. And I was able to come in and show that you can bypass those rules. <laughs> My name is Adrian. Uh, online, I'm known as Manfred, and I spent 20 years of my life uh, hacking video games and exploiting their online virtual economies. We'll be talking about, I think, all of these games except two. <laughs> <laughs> Other people have come out publicly, but not at the level that, you know, um, and transparency that I came out with. My time up on the stage, you know, this was like posing the chapter on like my 20 years of hacking online games. I was born in Poland, uh, grew up under somewhat of a corrupt government. Workers rose up and they were like against the government that was trying to crush her, basically. We emigrated in 1984. We sought asylum here in the United States. And then I just grew up around computers. I'm a huge gamer, and I was very curious about how my online games work. For example, my first game was Ultima Online. In Ultima Online, you could have a house inside the game. It was a highly sought after item. So I put a castle up for sale in this game on eBay, and I was expecting to get a couple hundred bucks for it. Then it sold for like $2,800. I was like, wow, this is bonkers. I had probably two, three hundred eBay listings going at once. You know, I was paying, you know, for my expenses, my college education, and things like that. And what kind of revenue did you generate? Probably shouldn't say. <laughs> Most people don't want to grind away in the game. You know, they don't want to spend eight hours a day like mining virtual rocks. They'd rather just pay somebody else to do that. Pretty quickly, you had um, hackers. You know, once they played some of the original games, you get to the end and their curiosity did not end. They wanted to do more than just play the games within the confines of what the game developers had intended. And they were able to change the code of the games. So this is where the fun part starts, because this is where you'd like break out some custom tools to like understand how it's working. One of my favorite exploits was in Star Wars Old Republic. Let's say you had five eggs in your inventory. You could say, hey, I want to delete three eggs. And then the game says, all right, I'll delete three eggs, and now you have two eggs in your inventory. You could tell the game, hey, I want to delete negative three eggs. Then when you subtract a negative, it becomes a positive, right? So you end up with eight eggs. So you could create infinite items. When online gaming really kicked off, it became new heights. Everyone was looking for glitches in games and bugs to take advantage of, to make more and more money out of it. OK, so this is a fun one. This game is called Wildstar Online. Basically, the, the Wildstar game allows you to place a bid on an item. Uh, so I'm going to create a buy order for some gadget, and I'm going to pay five units of in-game currency. But I'm going to modify this as it's going out to the game server, and I'm gonna say, I'll buy this for um, no, nine quintillion units of gold. So when the game subtracts that huge sum of money from me, it's gonna bottom me out beyond zero, and it's gonna roll me back to the top. So think of a car. Like, back in the day, you had a car with the odometer, and it had like, these little tumbling wheels, like, and then it hits nine, and then you add one more mile. The whole thing will roll and become zero again. Similar concepts in computing applies where it's called like an integer overflow or an integer or underflow. 32-bit computing, you can have a value up to 4.2 billion. If you add one more to that, it'll become zero. And the same thing with going the other way. Like if you have zero and you subtract one, we'll all have uh, basically nine quintillion or 18 quintillion gold uh, as shown here. I had about 12 trillion US dollars worth of, you know, in-game currency, which was bonkers. But the thing about this game is it wasn't very popular, so you couldn't sell more than maybe $100 per day, so... 
So you have to keep in mind that the vast majority of gamers are not interested in doing this. They lack the skills or the curiosity. Um, you have a very small subset who view this as a business. And they realized pretty early on there was a market for people, for gamers, who wanted to increase their capabilities within the game. For fairly significant amounts of money, it became a real business for some teenagers who were doing this. Because a lot of people in online games are trying to make a living. RuneScape Online is one really good example. You could run it on really old hardware. So it's a game that's popular in developing countries and low-income countries. Um, for example, in Venezuela, so there's people, you know, going into RuneScape as their day job to farm items and sell them to other players. The in-game currency is more stable than the Ve Venezuelan fiat currencies. And then they use the RuneScape currency to basically pay for their bills or buy a loaf of bread and do daily transactions. Some people, their entire livelihood depends on their participation in the game. And the game company can one day just completely shut them off. The online game is basically a totalitarian government, right? They can, they can ban your account for any reason. They can exile you from the game, basically by banning your account. And as time went on, more and more of these games started selling currencies directly to players, which is the same thing I was doing. So that's when I backed out and I said, all right, it's time to close this hacking for fun and profit chapter and, and move on. It was interesting because, you know, the solidarity movement that the government in Poland was trying to crush back in, you know, in the early 80s, it was workers' rights versus the government. And right now in online gaming, there's a similar theme going on. Right now, games like Axie Infinity allows for players to earn a living, condoned by the game. It's a blockchain-based game, meaning that the players own their assets and it's cryptographically proven. Like you log into this game, you build up your character, and then you can list it on an auction house, you get some money, and you can cash out. And then you have your other section of your player base. They just want to buy a character from another player. And in the end, everybody wins. Axie Infinity has a huge participation uh, in the Philippines. And people are like going to their day job to participate in this online economy where they're making a better living. Games are more than just what developers tell us how we should play them. And I was able to come in and show that, no, that you, you can bypass those rules. A game is basically a virtual country now where you have citizens and you want to attract more citizens and you want to give them the tools to, for them to produce goods and services. Keep your players happy, keep them as workers happy, and as a game company, they'll make more money.